Welcome to the San Francisco Writers Conference podcast, a celebration of craft, commerce, and community. I'm your host, Matthew Felix, and I'm here today with Lily Danziger. Lily is the author of Negative Space, a reported and illustrated memoir selected by Carmen Maria Machado as a winner of the Santa Fe Writers Project Literary Awards. Lily is the editor of Burn It Down, a critically acclaimed anthology of essays on women's anger. She's a contributing editor at Catapult and assistant editor at Barrel House Books. Her writing has been published by Guernica, Lit Hub, The Rumpus, Long Reads, The Washington Post, Playboy, Rolling Stone, and lots of other places. Welcome, Lily. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for, be, thanks for being here. I'm so excited that you're here. You know, months ago, <clears throat> excuse me, as you know, months ago, I read your article in, in Electric Literature, which was called uh, Canceling My Book Deal. So Canceling My Book Deal was the best career move I've ever made. So canceling my deal was the best move I've ever made. Subtitle of that article, that essay was a contract that doesn't suit your needs or expectations could be worse than no book deal at all. And so I, I read that article and everything just resonated. And I thought, you know, this, this would be such a good thing to talk about for our writers, for our listeners and viewers, because it's, it's just such important stuff. And so between the way you wrote the article and then all the lessons and the learnings that you got from your experience, as soon as I was done with the article, I wrote you. I mean, right away, I just wrote you and I said, hey, are you around? You know, do you want to do this? So I think like 20 minutes after I read that article, we had already set this up. So thanks for being so willing to come on. And I think this will be really great, um, like I said, for other writers to, to learn from your experiences. Um, so that's the first thing we're going to talk about. But then, of course, we're also going to talk about the book that the contract in question was related to, and that is Negative Space, your memoir, Negative Space. So we're going to talk about both. Cool. But let's go ahead and start with uh, with what started it all, which was that was your essay in electric literature. Now, as writers, I always hate to say, you know, most of us or all of us or whatever, but I think it's fair to say that many, many writers, when we're first getting started in particular, um, you know, the, the big hope is to get a book deal, right? And it sounds from your essay as though that was more or less the case for you. So when you started trying to find a deal for negative space, can you tell us kind of um, how you went about it initially? Yeah, there were a lot of stages of the process. You know, the book completely changed several times. Originally, it was meant to be an artist monograph, and then it became a memoir, and then it completely shifted the style of memoir. Um, and several times throughout that process, I thought I was done and <laughs> tried to get it published only to learn that I was in fact not done at all. So initially the very first round, um, I queried agents for, you know, the artist monograph version where the book was just about my father and his life and his artwork. Um, it was roundly rejected because my father's not a famous artist. So <laughs> agents were like, you know, we're not gonna be able to sell a big coffee table art book about an artist who nobody's ever heard of. Right. So, fair enough, I guess, you know. Um, so I <laughs> went back and revised and, you know, turned into a memoir. I tried the agent route again and got similar rejections. Um, and then I started looking at the small press route, you know, thinking, okay, I'm doing this kind of hybrid thing. It's an art book. It's a memoir. It's, it's not checking these like commercial boxes that agents are looking for. So maybe I'll find a small press that will, be willing to take that risk, you know, and publish something just because they think it's cool, not because it's necessarily going to make a million dollars. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's what I did. I went through a few rounds of that. And that's when I got that initial acceptance and, and signed the first deal. Um, so just to give, just to, yeah. sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but just to give writers an idea, how many iteration, how many, how long would you say roughly it took both chronologically and with regards to number of queries before you got, um, before you actually got the first offer? Mm -hmm. That was about five years into the process of writing it, five or six, um, which at the time I felt like was a really long time, <laughs> you know, it ended up taking more than twice that long, um, right. before it, it actually was published. Um, I can't remember exactly how many rejections there were before that first acceptance, but more than 20. Can I help you with that? Sure. <laughs> Cause I, sure. I secretly have the answer. It was okay. 50, 50 rejections. And the reason I that bring that- all, That was all together. All so together. 50, okay. 50, 50 oh, that was before the first final. one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So maybe 20 then in that first round, yeah. but I just wanted to underscore that because Again, for people, particularly those who are getting started out, but any of us, wherever we might be on, on our, 
the path of trying to get a traditional deal if that's where we are, just to underscore that how much work it takes, right? Both time yeah. and 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 um, the number of queries that you actually you actually go through. How what sort of advice would you give writers insofar as knowing? And I know this is really subjective, but I'm just curious. What sort of advice would you give to writers about knowing how many queries is enough versus, and, and I'm going to go the indie route versus maybe this project just isn't meant to be and I should move on to my next project. How mm -hmm. do you kind of suss out that sort of decision? Yeah, that's tough. I, I mean, I always was going to keep going. You know, for me, it was, it was less about you know, am I, should I give up on this and move on to the next thing? And more about like, okay, is it time to go back to the drawing board and rework it again? You know, mm -hmm. but I was always going to keep trying a different version. You know, it was, it was more like, okay, when I got this round of rejections and enough of them said a similar thing, you know, mm -hmm. if you get the same feedback from multiple agents, then I listened, you know, you can't revise to every piece of feedback because you'll just be running around in circles and you know, lose track of what you actually want the book to be. Right. Um, right. You know, and, and that feedback is so subjective, but when you start to hear the same thing over and over again from different people, then maybe that's worth, you know, looking into. Um, I didn't actually get to the point where I was considering putting it in the drawer until the last, last round when I ended up, you know, the last round that, the Santa Fe Writers Project was part of. And that was because I had done my homework at that point and I had made what felt like a complete list of everywhere else that I hadn't tried yet that would be good. You know, right. good for, right. for the book, good for, for me, um, right. reputable, all of that. You know, and I felt like I had kind of shot myself in the foot a little bit by querying too early. So that's okay. something else I would definitely advise is as much as we all want to finish the book and get it out there, don't query the first time you think you're done. You know? Right, right. Okay, and we're going to come back to that, I think. Um, but let's go back to, you have done these 20-ish queries, what have you, and you get the deal, you get your first deal. So how did that kind of transpire? And what did that feel like at that point in, in the process? I mean, it felt great. You know, I got the I got the email and said, this is great. Or we would love to publish it. I was so excited. I went out for drinks. I was celebrating, right. you know, finally this thing I've been working so hard for, for five, six years. Um, and, you know, when I got into the nitty gritty of the contract, I noticed some things that were less than ideal, but I rationalized because I wanted it to work. Right. <laughs> I really right. wanted it to be done first of all. And I wanted to see the book out there. Um, so I convinced myself that, you know, these little red flags were. And what were some of those red flags? What were some of those red flags? Um, I mean, the, the first and biggest one was just like the lack of any kind of publicity support, including, you know, I think they offered like, I can't remember exactly, but it was something like five arcs for reviews, which is just not, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not going to get you a lot of exposure. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, Even if so they're really like, carefully chosen five still. Right. You need more than five. You know, I think with, with SFWP, we sent out like the upwards of a hundred, yeah. maybe like 200. I don't know. It was a lot. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> with, Triple digits. Far and wide, you know? Um, but that, you know, I was like, that's okay. I'll save up and I'll buy some or like copies and send them out myself, you know? And then there was the, you know, you're pretty much on your own with publicity. Now it's like, well, that's fine. I'm a freelancer. I, you know, I have connections. I know how to navigate this world. I'll just, I'll handle that myself. And then there was the lack of distribution. And I was like, okay, a little bit more out of my depth, but I'll, I'll figure it out. You know, I'll, I've got I'll, a car or I've got, I can yeah, take the, right. I can take the, the subway. Uh, with I'll the, cold call a thousand bookstores all over the country. Why not? Sure. Whatever you know, it takes. How hard could it be? You know? <laughs> right, right. And part of it is just this like, you know, seat of my pants, I'll figure it out mentality that has gotten me far in life, but it, it also allowed me to rationalize something that, you know, the scale of, of that was impossible. I couldn't actually really do all that myself and do it well. Um, but it is tricky though, isn't it? Because my understanding, what I, I work with other writers and just marketing my own three books, 
you know, traditional, even if you get a traditional deal, you still are expected to do so much of your marketing and publicity. So it seems like it might be kind of hard to know, okay, this deal that I just got, is this normal or is this not normal? Was it just, sure. I mean, any, any additional thoughts on that and how you were able to realize, okay, wait, I knew I was going to have to do some of this, but was it just that there's nothing here? How, how did you know this was a red flag? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that was definitely part of why I was able to rationalize it. Cause I knew, you know, I had heard from other people that a lot of the publicity falls to the author and that's still very much true, but your press should be there to support you. What, you know, even if you're the one out there putting your face out there, sending out the queries, being on social media, doing events, setting up events, whatever it is, you know, the press should still be willing to send advanced copies to the people who agree to read it and review it. Once you've reached out to them, they should be helping you make sure that your book is in stock in bookstores that you're doing events with. You know, they, they should have your back, even right. if you're the one doing a lot of that work. Right, because um, it still is a collaboration. Yeah, and that was, you know... I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, versed in the finer details of what was normal versus beyond the pale. <laughs> um, right, right. But that I was all able to rationalize. The last straw ended up being, you know, I, I, I convinced myself that it'd be fine. I could do it all, you know, whatever, I'll figure it out. And I was waiting for an edit from the publisher. And I waited something like six months and then I finally, I emailed her trying to get an exact timeline because I wanted to set aside time to focus on doing my revisions. I was so excited to finally be working with an editor after just revising and revising and revising on my own for so long, you know, and I'd gotten feedback from other people, but that's not the same thing. It's like, okay, this is now my editor and we're right. going to do this together, you know? Yes. Um, and then I, and she said something in an email, I can't remember exactly how how this information came out but i came to realize that she was not actually editing the manuscript she was in fact putting the manuscript that i had submitted directly into layout that blew me away in your article yeah uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> i just like i panicked because i was you know first of all it's like well i thought we were gonna do edits you know it's not, it's not done it's not like ready to be printed you know i mean it's i've worked hard on it i think it's good but it's not ready for the public yet you know i still need to make some tweaks and polish it up. And, you know, I was looking forward to getting your help with that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then it was also just like, you know, okay, if I could rationalize that I was going to do all the publicity, I was going to do all the distribution. I was going to pay for my own arcs. I was going to do, you know, X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. And not get any editorial help. You know, then I just, I started to get angry and I was like, well, then what the, you know, I don't know if I can. Watch your mouth. Watch yeah. your mouth. <laughs> this is a family friendly podcast. I think, I don't know. You know, what the, what are you right. doing then? That why, you know, why do you get half of the profits from any sales? Well, and it really makes you wonder. I mean, something I was wondering when I read that part, because yeah, I, I'm glad you had that reaction because that's the reaction I had as a reader. It's like, okay, I could probably justify some of that other stuff as well, particularly if I've been working so long and I've, I wanted this deal and I finally got this deal. I would be in that same headspace, but then wait, my, my, my publisher is not going to help me edit the final version. And then the thing that I thought that my sort of follow-up thought there was, how is, how is this publisher making like just their business model? I don't even understand how that would work kind of on their end, right? But I mean, I yeah. guess publishing is tricky. So again, this is just sort of, I'm sure there's a reason they work that way. But yeah, that, that really surprised me. So yeah, at that and it's, you know, it's not even too like, you know, I, I'm not trying to say that this press was like um, predatory or anything like that. Right, I think it was right. just, you know, they're working on, on a different scale and with a different vision of like what it means to publish a book, you know, and, and if you just want to, you know, one, one thing in their favor, one thing that I was really excited about is that they do art books. So they were fully on board for having all the art images in full mm -hmm. color and mm -hmm. they had really like beautiful quality color printed pages, which is something that has had come up before and came up again later with SFWP. The images ended up being all in black and white, which was a compromise that I ended up being fine with, but it was, you know, something I agonized over a little bit at first yeah. when it came up. Um, so, you know, if I just wanted it printed as an object to say, here, I have a book, you know, then that would have been fine, but I had bigger 
ambitions than that. <laughs> yes, you did. And, but I think that does actually probably shed a lot of light into, into kind of their motive, their, like their model again, which is there, it sounds like, and again, we're not speaking for them and, and I don't know them, uh, but it sounds as if they're more about the craft of the book versus, yeah, versus kind of that commercial side of getting it out into the world. But again, you had bigger aspirations. So that meant for this book. And so that meant, wait a second, I might have to actually pull out of this deal. So when did you, when did it get to that point and what was kind of going through your head? And I'm also curious what people around you might've been telling you when you're, when you start thinking, wait, not only is this, are these red flags, but they're red enough and they're hoisted high enough on the flagpole. Yeah. I might actually need to get out of this. What can you take us through kind of what that was like? Yeah, so that was, um, I think, December 2016. So everybody was already in a raw emotional state. You know, it already felt like the world was crumbling. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got, you know, I, I sent an email, at, you know, carefully worded, like, just to clarify, you know, does, it, does this mean we're not going to be working together on edits? You know, like, let me make right. sure I'm not jumping to conclusions here. You know, and um, that was, yeah, it was in that conversation that I started to realize, like, okay, I might have made a mistake. Maybe I need to pull out of this. And it was horrible. It was scary. I was still trying to rationalize. I was still thinking, like, you know, maybe just, like, just get it out and then you can run with it. You can promote it yourself. You know, but there was a part of me that knew, like, no, this just isn't. Your gut. This isn't good enough. This isn't the right way. Um, and, you know, I talked to my writer's group about it and they all were like, yeah, it sounds like that's what you need to do. Mm, but, good. You know, well, that's like, good though. Yes. That's good. Yeah. You had that kind of support. Yeah. You yeah. know, and I, I talked to my husband about it and he, you know, he's not in publishing, but he was just like, well, yeah. So then what are they doing for you? But, yeah. you know, and I was like, okay. Yeah. Even, even from outside, it's clear that this is not how this right. is supposed to go. Right. Um, and I, yeah, I talked to a lot of people. I reached out to, you know, uh, several people who were in the industry and were published, you know, just to say, like, am I, is this cold feet? Am I just freaking out? Or is this actually a problem? Um, and, yeah, everybody was like, yeah, your book should be bigger than that. Your book should be, should have support. You should, you know, well, there will be another deal out there. And of course, that was the scary thing. So it's like, what if this is the shot? What if this is the one yes that we always talk about? You only need one yes, right? Totally, so I totally. One, and then I canceled it and then that was it. And the book right. was never published. Um, right. That's what would be going through my mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it was terrifying. And um, it was it really stressed me out. I got like a bunch, I got, <laughs> got like my first gray hairs that month. <laughs> your, oh, your first gray hairs? <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was a uh -huh. lot of like acid reflux and, <laughs> you know, you know it's stressful. But I, yeah. I knew, I mean, I knew pretty clearly that I had to do it. I, it was just a matter of psyching myself up. Okay. But my most important question, I guess, though, follow up would be did you ever get that acid reflux under control? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, good, good. I think there's Tums or something like that. Yeah. I think there's ways you can deal with that. Um, but, but in all seriousness, I do want to read a quote from your essay that speaks to this fear, um, which again, I don't know who wouldn't have this sort of fear, right? So you said, quote, I knew I had to do this scary thing and stand up for my book because nobody else would if I didn't. And to me, I think that's a really important part here of what's going on is this idea that we have to be our, our own best advocates. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I knew, you know, this, the press wasn't going to tell me, like, okay, yeah, this, you know, we're not going to do the best for your book. Why don't you go somewhere else? You know, I mean, they, they, she did kind of offer me an out a little bit when we were having this conversation. She said, you know, she, I think she could tell that I was leaning in this direction, you know, and was like, if you want to sever the contract, we can. Oh, well, that's nice. You know, yeah. But yeah. I think, it, you know, it's because I was asking so many questions. She was like, it's clear that, you, you know, I think you, you're looking for maybe something that we can't give you, you right. know, but nobody else was going to make that decision for me. I didn't have an agent at that time who I can turn to and, you know, plan my career with. And this was something that I had poured years of work into, you know, and I, I, I didn't want to give it short shrift, you know, I didn't, right. I, it felt like, um, not believing in the work if I was just going to settle. 
right. and, and put it out in a way that it was very clear to me, even though I didn't know not much about the industry at the time, I knew enough to understand that I was not setting myself up for success with that yeah. deal. <laughs> yeah. So did you back out of it in that conversation or was there something else that actually got you to, to actually take that leap and make the decision definitively? I just, I mulled it over for a little while and I, you know, I spoke to a few people. Um, I think there was one conversation that really helped me seal the deal um, was, was I spoke to Julie Bunton on the phone, who, you know, she's a published author. She has a book out called Marlena and she at the time was running the catapult classes program that I taught for. Um, so we had, you know, a professional relationship and I can't even remember. I think I just like mentioned it in an email to her about something else. Cause I just was stressing out. Um, and she was like, do you want to talk on the phone? Can you know, want to talk about this? And she kind of gave me the pep talk that I needed. Like mm-hmm. your book is good. It's going to find a better place. You have to stand up for it. Don't settle. And, you know, and, and also just telling me like, no, none of this is normal. This is not how this is supposed to go. Your press should be doing X, Y, and Z if they're not, leave right. Right. <laughs> and just hearing that definitively because you know like you said before there's so much that's murky and we don't really know what exactly is is standard and what is kind of messed up but standard and what right. is messed up and not standard right and this is really underscoring for me so the last i think it was the last episode i did um with Lori Doyle and Ryan Sloan was about community and mm. just about how important it is as writers, because for 10 years I was just writing in my, in my Gara and I didn't know any other writers. I didn't have community. I tried and kind of failed to find it, but, but this, this is just such a perfect example of what I was talking about with them is you had people you had, she, she was able to say, Hey, let's talk about this on the phone. I know I have experience in this and your writing group helped you to, to realize that you weren't crazy and that, yeah, this, this wasn't maybe the best fit. So I just kind of want to underscore that aspect of it. Cause I think the community part, cause we, that word just gets thrown around so much, but I think particularly in our cases, it really is essential to our, to our success and to the success of our work. It's so important. Yeah. I mean, if I didn't, if I didn't have people, to talk to and to, you know, and to have that gut check of like, am I, am I right to feel like this is wrong or am I, you know, there was definitely a part of me that was like, am I just freaking out because I'm finally getting this thing and it's scary and I am looking for ways that it's going to go wrong. Right. 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 Um, So it sounds like it wasn't so tricky because she kind of gave you an out. So it wasn't too tricky to actually get out of the contract. It was more just saying, yeah, I want out. Was it kind of that simple or? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. It wasn't, you know, there there had been no advance and there was no, no money had changed hands. So I didn't have to like give back a bunch of money that I already right. spent or anything like that. It was right. just, you know, like, okay, yes, I would like to sever this contract. Okay, awesome. You. Goodbye. So then the next thing I was wondering about is, you know, at that moment, did you feel any sense of empowerment? Because really what you're doing there is you're taking your power back. But at the same time, it's this bittersweet taking your power back. So I'm wondering... Did you, did you have any sense of, you know what, even though this is difficult, this feels good because I, I'm honoring what, what seems right? Or were you still sort of so in the throes of doubt that that maybe didn't come until later? Yeah, I think I, think I mostly just felt nauseous. <laughs> <laughs> Are we talking about the acid reflux again or was this yeah. just like normal nausea? Just all of that. All of, all the, of the above. above. Uh-huh. I think, you know, there was a part... There was a part of me that knew that, you know, I was imagining a future in which I would look back and know that that had been the right move, you know? And I think I, even at the time I was like, okay, when I get the real book deal, I'm going to write an essay about this. <laughs> um, yeah. and knowing that, you know, I, ha- I had to imagine that future in which I had a better book deal. And I was looking back and thinking, oh, thank God I didn't take, I didn't settle for that first deal. You know? And I, I just had to like believe that that would, happen because if I let myself imagine the other future where the book never sold and I had missed my chance and I regretted it forever I wouldn't have had the courage to do it yeah well that moment is here yes (laughs) (laughs) here we are let's honor that moment because you're here and I I hope you've already honored that moment many times in the past two months since the book has been out but um so let's talk about that so you cancel the deal so what did you do next how did you because you just said you know you visualized the right future the future you actually wanted yourself for yourself and for your book versus getting sucked into the negative side of things although 
Um, so, so what are some of the things that you did to keep going, to keep pushing towards what you actually did want, a deal that was the right deal? Um, I gave myself a couple months to sulk first, you know, and to like wallow in self-pity and you know, fear and, you know, the possibility of regret. And, you know, I, I didn't make myself look at the manuscript for a while because I, I had thought I was done. You know, I had already started a proposal for what I was going to do next. And I was already thinking about like being done with this project and moving on and seeing it published. And so to then go back and have to do it, you know, have to rip it open and start revising again was, I didn't want to, you know, so I, I allowed myself a little bit of time, a little bit of distance, but then I also, you know, the terror that I felt when I heard that she was putting the manuscript that I had sent directly into layout that, you know, made me realize, okay, maybe it's not actually done. You know, uh -huh. if, I, if I was like panicked at the idea of, of that version being made public, then clearly there's more work to do. Well, that was my question was, how did yeah. you know? Yeah. How did you know? Yeah. And that's it. That's it. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. So after I, you know, after I took, took some time to, you know, feel bad for myself and <laughs> be upset, I, I went back in and I kind of, you know, I thought of it like a clean slate, like, okay, now, how do I turn this into something that I would not panic at the idea of people reading? <laughs> um, and I did a bunch more major revisions. I took some writing workshops. I traded full manuscripts with a couple people in my writer's group. I uh, went to Tin House and paid for the, the additional mentorship on top of that, where uh, one of the instructors reads your whole manuscript. And um, that was Melissa Phoebos who read it and gave me really necessary advice um, basically pointed out a whole other storyline that I had been trying to get away with omitting. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Yep. yep. Um, and yeah, and I, I worked on it for four or five more years and then tried again. And, you know, at that point I felt secure and, and confident in the idea that it was a small press book, you know, and in, during that time I was also going to a lot of readings and, spending time on Twitter and, you know, learning a lot more about the literary world and the different kinds of small presses and, do, you know, doing my homework to learn the difference between, you know, a substantial, reputable small press that can launch your book successfully and like, you know, rinky dink small things that you know, are fine what, if that's what you're looking for, but not what I was looking for. And what are some of the characteristics of those presses that you, that, that fit those criteria that you thought, okay, this is the kind of press that, that would work for me? Um, I mean, I paid attention to small press books that were coming out that were getting attention. You know, I mean, I think that was a big part of it. It's like which which small presses are putting out books with the support in place to get them reviewed and to get them on lists and to get them, you know, in events in conversation with bigger name authors and you know, that was a, that was a big part of it. That was kind of the first round. It's just like, who's visible, right? Because originally I had just looked through the, um, the list on it. Is it published in Marketplace or? Publishers, or, Publishers Marketplace. Or, or, yeah, that has just like the master list of all, every small press that exists. Yep. And I just wrote down like every one that takes memoir. You know, <laughs> that was my but original it, cast a white net approach. But it's tough. It's tough though, right? It is tough to, and you have to, and the thing that, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the thing that I keep, we keep coming back to that I really admire and that I think is a great lesson, again, for other writers who are just trying to figure this out that I really would like to underscore is you do the work. You yeah. do the research. You've done so much research and you've done both about, you know, the industry, about the presses, about the, the writing process itself. I mean, you really invested the time and energy and that's what it takes because it would be really easy for me just to, you know, I, I go on your, you know, I go on LitHub or whatever, and I see your article and I go on Rumpus. Oh, and there she is again. And I go on just to think that, well, this, this is easy for her. She's got support. She's just out there. And, and, you know, and over and over, I talk to, to, to writers and having also lived similar experiences myself, you know, my novel took 10 years and it's, it's, that's not how it works. It does take time and work and perseverance. So I just kind of want to underscore that because you you just did so much of the right stuff, the research, and it and it obviously paid off. So how yeah. did it pay off? Because you end up you ended up with a deal. So how did we get from you've got your list of presses to getting a deal? Yeah. So I 
revised and revised and I learned the lesson that when you think it's done, that actually means you need to just put it aside for two months and then read it again and you see all the ways that it's not actually done yet. And so I did that several times and that's why it took five more years. Um, and then I made my very carefully curated list of, you know, I think it was like 15 or 20 small presses instead of the like hundred that I, you know, that I sent it to originally. Um, and I started, and a bunch of them were contests also. I, I started paying attention to contests and seeing those as a way to identify potentially, uh, you know, more substantial attention that you might get for a small press book. Because if, a, if an author who is familiar to me and whose work I respect and who's, you know, I know to have integrity will attach their name to a contest, then that probably means the press has some clout and a, you know, a decent reputation, right. even if I haven't heard of them. Right. Um, so I submitted to a bunch of contests and then found out that I, was, I had made the long list for the SFWP award. And I was like, okay, that's a good sign. Okay, try not to get too excited. And then I found out that I got on the short list. I was like, okay, all right, okay. You get a little <laughs> more excited. I think I'm allowed to be a little excited now. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and at that point, the, the publisher let me know that they wanted to publish the book either way, but they were still just waiting for the final decision. And, and I, had, I was a little gun shy. I think, you know, I, I really took my time to be like, okay, well, let me learn everything about you. <laughs> 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 Thanks for your offer. I'll let you know. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and I asked a ton of questions, um, but Andrew, who runs SFWP, has been in the business for a long time, and he had answers at the ready, you know, for, for all of my questions and was really transparent about how they work and what they were able to do and what they were not able to do and what they might be able to figure out if it was really important to me and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we had a, a really good back and forth. Um, and then, yeah. And then I had that moment where I was like, Oh, so glad I didn't settle for that. Yes. First of all. <laughs> yes. yes. It's all about going with your gut and, and, and getting that support. And yeah. So, so kudos to you for, for all of that. And I'm so glad you got the deal that was the right deal. Yeah. I want to end kind of this segment before we actually talk about the book, which we're going to do very, very shortly with a quote from your essay again, quote, uh, I don't know what will happen. This is obviously before the book has come out. Mm -hmm. I don't know what will happen. It could still be a flop after all of this, but no matter what, I'll know I gave it the best fighting chance of reaching readers who will cherish it. Oprah Daly called Negative Space, quote, a poignant portrait of the identities we construct out of grief. I would love Oprah Daly to say something nice about one of my books. Jane Ratcliffe of Electric Lit observed that each sentence, I love this quote, quote, each sentence is a finely wrought work of art, work of art unto itself. And the last one I'll read, T. Kira Madden said, T. Kira Madden said that uh, this is, quote, one of the greatest memoirs of this or any time, close quote. So congratulations. I don't think this was a flop. I think this has been uh, quite the success. And again, it's only been two months. So you're still, you're still uh, getting started, but, but congrats on that. And congrats on making, you know, on, uh, cause it's just so courageous. And I really, that's why, like I said, as soon as I was done reading your article, I was like, okay, wait, where's your email? This is somebody I want to talk to. Yeah. So, so let's talk about the book. Negative space, um, we've kind of alluded to it a little bit, but can you give us kind of the high level synopsis of what the book's about? Sure. Um, so it's a hybrid memoir that is the story of my father, Joe Shackman, who was an artist in the East Village in the 80s. He was also a heroin addict and he died when I was 12. And the kind of core story is about his life and his artwork. Uh, but then there's also an investigative narrative of the story of me piecing together the story of his life. Um, and then the third storyline that's in there also is my life after his death, growing up, uh, you know, a kind of degenerate teenager in the East Village, dropping out of high school and ending up at Columbia. Yep. Yep. Okay. So one of the, I want to read a quote uh, from the book that sort of sets out how you, what you thought, I think your initial sort of purpose or motivation was for writing the book. Quote, I was asking my father's, and this is when you're starting to, you're having a conversation with one of your father's friends. And that's one of the ways, I can't remember if you just said this or not, but one of the ways you learned about your father and undertook this project was through interviews with his friends. You're interviewing one of his friends and you say, quote, I was asking my father's friends all the questions I couldn't ask him, trying to put together a story of his life and his art. 
hoping to understand him better. So like you just said, it kind of starts out, your motivation initially was more about him, but then very quickly you realize this is opening up things for you. So can you tell us kind of as you got in what you realized this was doing for you on a more personal level, not just about him, but your experience as well? Yeah. Um, so initially I was really resistant to the idea of it being a memoir. I just wanted mm. to write about my father. I wanted to write about art. Uh, in the very, very first draft, which is now like 11, 12 years ago, there was a part where I referred to his daughter, Lily. And, oh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Was, wow, you really did. Really, yeah. yeah, really trying to create that distance. Interesting. Um, and I kind of got dragged, like kicking and screaming into turning it into a memoir because everybody who read it was asking like, okay, but what is it like to interview all these people who knew your father? What is it like to get the uglier story? You know, because the original impetus was was yeah that he died when i was 12 and i completely idolized him and you know thought he was just like one of the greats and deserved to be in the canon of great artists and you know so i wanted to write this art book about him but i also wanted to fill in kind of the the uglier details you know he also was addicted to heroin for a long time he was not always great to my mother he didn't pay child support after they split up you know there it was not great in every way um and so as i was piecing that together everybody wanted to know what that process was like and so I kind of made part of that, made that process part of the story, you know, right. the experience of learning these things. Um, and then it just inevitably opened up more and more personal avenues into how this was shifting my relationship with my father and eventually with my mother as well. And with my own memories of my childhood and my sense of my own identity and how I fit in the world. And, you know, it just kind of exploded everything. And <laughs> well, something, out. yeah. And something that, that's part of that, obviously underlying sort of all of that is, is your grief, right. Yeah. At, at the loss of your father. And so you say, quote, what I found was a new path into my, a new path into my own grief and anger. Mm -hmm. And then you also talk about giving grief form, which I really liked. So can you talk about how you sort of unexpectedly and what that was like when you realized, wait, this isn't just an art book about my dad. This is also, this is, this is also about my grieving process. And, and can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I, it's so weird. The walls that we put up in our own brains as writers, you know, and what we convince ourselves we're really doing and what we convince ourselves we can do without looking over here at this other thing. Yeah. And, you know, so, <laughs> so initially I thought I could just write this art book and I was just, you know, doing this to honor my father. I was just doing this to share his work with the world. But then it later became very obvious that if I was going to write a book about my father who died when I was 12, it was obviously going to be about grief mm -hmm. also, you know, and the whole thing, in fact, was generated out of grief. You know, the whole desire to do this in the first place and to make a book about him was part of grief. You know, it was a product of grief. Um, and I don't know how I was not aware of that at first. You know, it's like when you look back and you're like, oh, Duh, you, know. you didn't feel the sledgehammer? <laughs> yeah. Like you didn't feel that? Right. No. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I'm just gonna make an art book. You know, it'll be fun. Um, yeah. And so, of course, as I was learning more about him, I was also like uncovering these kind of pockets of of different forms of grief and discovering that there was a whole bunch of anger bubbling under the grief that I hadn't even been aware. Mm -hmm. was there you know but it's like just, just like lifting up these floorboards and being like what's under there let's see mm -hmm. um and some of it was interesting and beautiful and some of it was scary and ugly and yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love what you said um again this idea of giving of giving the grief form you said um I was writing quote I was writing my grief into these pages to make it tangible so it would exist somewhere outside of me and I wouldn't have to drag its weight with me always. Mm -hmm. So I just love that notion of, look, this, is, this stuff is inside me and you didn't necessarily realize it initially. And, and you realize this grief and this anger and this other stuff, different emotion is in you. And I love this notion that writing can help sort of get that and we can put it over here in that, that exercise. And did you find that in the end that you were kind of successful in that and that we can do that? Yeah, I mean, to an extent. You know, um, you can get you can get enough of it out of you that there's room for other stuff also, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but then you and 
it's easier for me to talk about it now because of, you know, I've spent so much time kind of intellectualizing it and, you know, digging into it as a concept and articulating. And, you know, now I can talk about all these aspects of my childhood and whatever that I might have not wanted to talk about before. Um, right. But then it's still, you know, I just like um, last week I was going through and getting ready to box up all the like material and notes and, and stuff that I had just kept on hand in case I needed them in edits or whatever. Um, all my, my notebooks and recordings and drafts and whatever, and also my father's notebooks and, you know, the original source material. And I reread a letter that he wrote to me when I was eight years old and I just started bawling. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Still, still in there. <laughs> Well, you know what I, w I was also thinking, and this isn't in my notes because I didn't think we had time for this, but you just touched on it. So I'm going to say it anyway. Just this notion of, of time, mm -hmm. right? Because when you're reading that letter, you go back to being that eight-year-old eight girl, I would think, right? I think so much of memory, this whole idea that, and maybe I'm getting a little metaphysical here, but <laughs> this idea that it's not just linear, right? I'm sorry, you're reading that letter and you're crying, not because you're what you're experiencing now, you're crying because you're, you're taken back to that experience, right? Um, and again, you did that for 10 years with this. So that must've been, you know, quite intense. <laughs> lot, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about though, you, we've mentioned a couple of times, he, your father was an artist and uh, a successful artist, even if maybe not, you know, huge, but a successful artist during his time. And it, in addition to be able, being able to talk to his friends to research his life and learn more about him and, and help with your grief, uh, the art, you had his art. Like most of us wouldn't have that, right? You're surrounded by your father and all these clues. And so that's obviously a really interesting part for me uh, and I'm sure for everybody who reads this book about this memoir. Like you're, you're just surrounded by puzzle pieces. So can you talk to us a little bit about, about the presence of his art and how that helped you to put sort of these pieces together and, and learn more about his life? Yeah. Um, that was another one of those like obvious moments that's only obvious afterwards, you know, <laughs> that I, I initially wanted to write about the art because a lot of it is uh, kind of deteriorating. You know, he didn't work with the most stable materials. He worked with a lot of found materials and a lot of just like whatever was on hand. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite pieces is paper mache, which, you know, I don't I know if you're familiar with it, but it's mm -hmm. not very, uh, substantial you know it kind of yeah. starts to crumble over time um it's just this very delicate piece that i've just been watching kind of slowly crumble mm. over the years mm -hmm. um and so i wanted to write about the art because i wanted to preserve it i wanted to archive it i wanted it to have a life and be appreciated beyond you know it's like what happens when i die and then nobody knows what any of this weird creepy stuff is <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. i wanted it to be appreciated um and, but then as I was writing about the art and, you know, writing about when he was making each piece and, you know, kind of trying to contextualize it, it, it became clear to me that the art was kind of the most direct line that I have to him, you know, and it was as I was interviewing all these people in his life, all these people who had known him, the art was the closest I was going to get to him being able to speak for himself and, right. and tell me the story directly. Um, so, you know, the art was the original impetus, but then it became the core of the thing in kind of a different way. Totally different than way. Than I initially yeah. intended. Yeah. You know? How do you see his art differently after having written this book? I, I see a lot more, I'm like looking at a piece that's right here. <laughs> you can <laughs> cheat, you can cheat. I'm using my <laughs> notes, you can use your notes. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I see a lot more vulnerability in it. I think than I did before. I, I mean, I always knew that he was representing himself in a lot of these images, but I learned so much more about what he was representing and, you know, what aspects of himself he was trying to show the world and trying to, trying to capture and preserve and articulate. Um, and so knowing the stories behind them, you know, I, I can, I can see a lot more of like the emotion and, and, the kind of fragility and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. Was there ever any doubt? And I think I already know this answer now based on some of the things you've already said, but I was wondering as I was preparing for today, you know, if there was ever any doubt that you would include the pictures of his work in the book, because I'll just say, uh, you know, I'm just so glad you did. 
I mean, it's just, it so complements the text. And, and um, I love that he had, you know, different styles and different periods. And I, I mean, for me, there's just no question that, that those photographs belong in that book. And I'm so glad that you were able to include it. Was there ever any doubt that you'd be able to do that? No. Okay. That was, that was, <laughs> that was um, you know, I never quite came to that. I, I, had, um, I had some people suggest, you know, that I might have an easier time without the images or maybe just like, you know, maybe one image to start off each chapter or, you know, trying to suggest ways to make it more sellable. Um, and I always just, I always brushed that off immediately. And I, I never actually was at the point where a publisher was saying, we'll publish it if you take out all the images. But I knew that if I ever got to that point, that would have been a decision that I would not have agonized over as much as canceling this other deal. You know, right. that was an immediate no, no, thank <laughs> right. you. Right. Well, I mean, it is tricky, you know, because I, I publish book for publish books for indie authors, and adding pictures just drives the cost way up. And then, and then the col color issue we already talked about. So I can't understand from kind of the other side of the aisle, like why why that could be tricky. But mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad they figured it out. I'm glad you guys figured it out. Yeah. Let's shift gears um, completely, and well, not completely. I mean, because it's all related. But let's shift <laughs> gears. Uh, the book is largely an exploration of grief, like we've already talked about, but it's also a big exploration of addiction. You've already mentioned that your father was uh, a heroin addict. I can't remember if you've already said in our conversation that your mother was also a heroin addict. Um, and then later you realized that you were addicted to cocaine. So can you tell us a little bit about just kind of, I mean, there's so many, this, this could be a whole other, a whole other uh, podcast episode. Cause this, this is just, there's so much here. Um, how, tell us just a little bit, I guess, about how addiction fits into the story, sort of at a high level. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's obviously, it's a major part of the story. It is ultimately what broke my parents up, even though I didn't know that going into it. That was something I learned in the process of reporting the book. Um, but it was also, it was something that I was very aware of how I was going to handle it. You know, I was very resistant to being at all salacious. You know, there's, there's a lot of um, just horrible portrayal of addiction mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in pop culture in general, in books, you know, especially on TV. I think TV and movies do it worse than books in general, but there's plenty of bad representation in books as well. Um, where it just makes a person one dimensional, you know, and then as soon as you show a person has addiction problems, then that is who they are. And they, they become this like zombie and everything about who they were disappears. Right. Um, and that was something that I was pushing against because that is just not my experience, mm -hmm. you know, um, in my own life. And especially with my parents, you know, my, from the outside, it might look like, they did a lot of things wrong and they did, but they also did a lot of things right. You know, and they, it was, that was part of, you know, to go back to that letter that I was reading the other day, part of what made me cry reading it was just like how wonderful it was. It was this beautiful letter. It was about uh, Shabbat candles and it was about, you know, belief in God and what is prayer and what, you know, all the different religions trying to accept, access these same ideas and they use simplified concepts to do it. I was like, sat down and wrote like three pages about this to an eight-year-old. Like, right. that's amazing. That's <laughs> totally amazing. It's totally amazing. Um, I, I mean, and, and you talk about how, yes, your parents were addicts when you were growing up, but you had a great childhood. Yeah. And, and in saying that, you're not saying that there weren't things also wrong at right. that time, but you talk about you were happy. I mean, there, there yeah. are certain advantages to only knowing a certain experience, right? And, and you didn't necessarily know. You, as you got older, you obviously started to realize there were some things that maybe shouldn't, that weren't necessarily right. But, but overall, you had a happy childhood and you did idolize your father. Well, you yeah. wouldn't have idolized him if it was all just hell growing up. So. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. And so I thought you talked about the addiction. I mean, I did think, and th this is one of the things, again, that I loved about this book, is I did think you you portrayed it in sort of, I won't say all of its complexity, because it's just so complex, but many, you know, it's multifacets, particularly, you know, you expressed your anger, but then you also had so much empathy at the same time. And so... Um, and, you know, and it did get me thinking about just the misconceptions that we have about addiction and this whole notion that... Um, 
addicts can just decide not to be addicts. Like right. just get over it, get over it. And right. I think you say, I think I have a, yeah, I have a quote here along those lines, right? You say, quote, I was shocked at myself. And I don't remember what this incident was something your dad had done something related to his addiction. And you said, quote, I was shocked at myself for feeling such anger at an addict as if addiction were a simple issue of willpower. And I think to me, that's maybe the biggest misconception. I don't know. Do you have any other thoughts on kind of the misconceptions that we have about, I mean, you just said this whole idea that they're just one dimensional, which mm -hmm. is so true. Any other thoughts on that idea that, you know, we just got to get over it. Just stop being an addict, get your life together, move on. Yeah. I mean, works. people treat it as a, um, a behavior or a lifestyle or, you know, any number of things that it isn't you know, it's not treated as, as voluntary, uh, you know, and they, they treat it as the fault of the person who is struggling. But, you know, it's very clear to me that my parents wanted to stop. You know, my mother eventually did um, successfully, which, you know, I was another thing that I hadn't really looked that closely at in my life until I sat down to write about it. And I was like, it's actually really impressive. <laughs> you know, not everybody can do that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, that whole idea that, you know, if you want to quit badly enough, you can, is just not the way it works, unfortunately. And yet, something that's really, again, just another really powerful moment in this book is you did. Right. You did quit. <laughs> <laughs> so, Forget everything we just said a second ago, uh, because you did quit as a result of willpower. But what the reason I bring this up is not only just because that's fascinating in and of itself and admirable in and of itself, but because your ability to quit, the willpower that you found just to do it cold turkey was related to your parents' addictions, right? Can you just speak to that just kind of briefly, how their addictions helped you realize, to hell with this, I'm not even doing rehab, I'm just done. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it's also... I resist the urge to downplay my own drug use. And this was something that I struggled with in the book as well. I, I originally didn't even want to include it because I was like, it's not relevant. It's not even on the same scale, you know? So it's like child's play, whatever, because it only lasted for like a year, a little more than a year. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it never kind of progressed to the point that my parents' addictions did. You know, I think there is a, there's kind of a point of no return where after that, you're not going to be able to get out without, a lot of support and luck and <laughs> help and yeah. compassion. Um, but I was able to kind of recognize that precipice when I reached it and I was able to see that I was like, I was about to enter that world um, and decide not to. And I, you know, I think most people don't recognize that turning point until after they've crossed it. Right. <laughs> um, but it was, yeah, it was, you know, remembering everything that my parents had been through and remembering seeing them struggle for so long and struggle and relapse and try again and go to clinics and get sick and, you know, all of that stuff. It's like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Right. <laughs> right. Um, you know, but it's the kind of the double-edged sword of that is that having their example also kind of allowed me to get to that point in the first place because it allowed me to downplay and rationalize and think, you know, like, oh, well, I'm not that bad, so I'm fine. Right, right. So speaking of double-edged swords, did you not think at some point, or you must have, or how did you, or did you? I'll let you answer. I'll stop trying to answer for you. But this double-edged sword, did you not, didn't it not occur to you, wait, you might be playing with fire, as you start to learn more about your father and learn things about your father that you didn't know. And that you do have this idealized sort of myth, you know, this myth of your father as this guy who's the artist and that, again, that you kind of idolize and he's writing you these beautiful letters. And so there's that image of him, but then you don't necessarily know what you're going to uncover as you, as you do start doing your, your investigation and your research. So did you have any trepidation about you know, about what you might find out and might not want to have found out. Yeah, definitely. Um, there were, there were a few points where I kind of was like, why am I doing this? Like, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't you know, why am I like pulling at these scabs? Um, but I, I, 
I think, you know, there were, there were also a couple points where I, I kind of regretted choosing this as my first book because it was so hard in so many ways. Not that, I mean, you know, writing a book is always hard, but there were things about this one in particular that just really felt like an uphill climb um, personally. And then also just in terms of like getting it published, you know, it's this weird in between hybrid thing. It's an art book, but it, nobody's heard of the artist. It's a memoir, but it has pictures in it. It's, you know, it's like, it didn't fit neatly into any box. Um, and I think if it had been almost anything else, I probably would have given up on it, but because it was about and for my father and it was tied up in honoring his art and preserving it and his legacy and sharing his work with the world and doing my part to canonize him. You know, it's like, I couldn't stop. I couldn't give up, you know, even at those points where it felt impossible, all the doors were being closed in my face or, you know, earlier the parts where I didn't really want to keep going. And I was realizing that I was maybe opening doors that would have been better left closed. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I so, but when those, so when those doors were open, when you found mm -hmm. out, for example, that your, your father hadn't treated, you know, had, had not been, hadn't treated some of your mother's experiences, you know, had been sort of abusive or hadn't respected the abuse that she had gone mm -hmm. through. Um, how did you reconcile those sorts of, and some of the, you know, the depths to which his addiction took him that you might not have known about before you investigated this book. Mm -hmm. How did you reconcile the two? the image that you had before and the, and, and the person that you learned about? Yeah, I kind of didn't, which, you know, it kind of ended up being part of the crux of the book. You know, I kind of, I kept waiting for this explosive, like idol crashing moment, you know, where like the scales fall from my eyes and now I see the truth <laughs> moment. And it mm. just kept not happening, you know, and I, even after I was learning one damning thing after another and I was like okay is this gonna be the thing <laughs> you know, is this gonna be the thing that makes me stop it makes me let go of this like image of my father as this great man um and I was almost I was like waiting for it and almost you know trying to push myself there because I felt like that's what this story needed and where it was going um but then to be true to my actual experience of learning those things, the reality is that I was able to just see both. You know, I was able to see more, um, but the stuff that I learned didn't erase the stuff that had been there all along. Because they're not necessarily contradictory, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And but but again, that's not how we usually see these things. We're, we we want to see things in black and white. He was either a good guy or a bad guy. He was right. either healthy or he was an addict. He, and 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 this to me was one of the most again powerful aspects of this of the book when you come to this realization that like wait a second both of these versions of him or both of these realities about who he was there's they're not contradictory they're actually complementary and you know I'm, those are my words but um because that's the reality because we're just really complicated <laughs> right and so i love that and i'm going to read a quote that i think really sums it up um because I, again, I just love this whole notion in this part, this part of your exploration. You said, quote, I may have been able to learn, excuse me, I may have been able to learn more about who he was as a man, but even the ugliest truths wouldn't change who he was to me as my father. And I, I just love that. And I think that that is one, and there are a couple other quotes I could read uh, where you kind of explore that theme, but I just like that theme of, or that notion of, okay, but he's still my dad. And yeah. what he was to me as my dad, the guy who writes me the leather, the guy who makes arts with, art with me, the guy who inspires me and all that makes me laugh, all these different things, that's still who he was. There's not a contradiction. So I just, I just love that. So thank you for that. The last thing that I'll say, because um, we are running low on time, is one thing I was reading or thinking as I was reading was you know, I don't know that I know my parents as well as you know your father as a result of doing this, this research. I've never, I've never talked to all of their friends about what my parents were doing at the age when, you know, you, that you were researching, for example. Um, I don't have a bunch of art and my parents are still alive and things, but, um, I, you know, I'm not surrounded by clues like you were. <laughs> so I couldn't help but think, and you do end up touching on this towards the end, that you know, you might know him better as a result of this project than you would have were he still alive. Any yeah. thoughts on that? 
Yeah, it's, I mean, it's strange. And I think, you know, I think a lot about the many ways, good and bad, that my life would be different if he were here, you know? But yeah, I don't think, I mean, I wouldn't have written this book if he were here. There's a, I mean, there's a chance that I still would have decided to make an, a book of his art, sure. but it would have gone in a very different direction. You know, it would have been, it would have been, you know, I kind of, I think of this as a collaboration with him already, but if it was a direct collaboration with him here to give input, who knows, you know, it would have looked completely different. You might not even um, be talking to him. At that right. Point. <laughs> <laughs> right. Who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, that's a strange kind of like thing to realize that I have this, this knowledge and this gift of being, getting to spend all this time with him in a way um, because he's not here. Um, but of course it's not the same, you know, knowing right. somebody intimately as, a, you know, a static figure of the past is not the same thing as knowing them in your ongoing shared lives together. Right. It's maybe not that maybe my question shouldn't have been that do you, that you know him better. It's more like you just know him differently. Yeah. Yeah. So the last quote that I'm going to ask you about before we wrap up is, um, Near the end of the book, along these lines of what we've been talking about, you say, quote, I wonder sometimes what will happen when I'm finally done with this book, when I don't have this search to keep me connected to him anymore. I expect that I'll mourn him all over again in a whole new way. So I'm just curious, again, your book just came out two months ago. So the question is almost maybe almost premature, but although the book's been done for a while, publication, I mean, it was done before it was published, but so just any thoughts on kind of how your relationship and how you've kind of been navigating that space since wrapping up the project? Yeah, I, you know, that, that of course has come to mind for me as well, but yeah, I think I'm still in it, Mm -hmm. you know, this post publication phase where I'm still talking to people about the book, still like posting about it regularly doing events, uh, you know, it's It's not over. Yeah. yeah, It's still ongoing. Um, But I did, I just, last week i think this time is so weird just last week ha- finally had the big like, gallery show party um that you know i originally wanted to be my launch but then because of covid it kind of it got delayed. Well, when i wrote you that was supposed to be the next day i think and then i think did you have to cancel it because you you were you had a gallery space and you were saying i've got something yeah. i think the next oh, day I think or... it was the, the original the original date that you had asked if i could talk was like okay. the date of the show okay yeah yeah, <laughs> no. yeah. yeah. that probably won't work that probably yeah. won't work although it would have been cool to do it in the gallery you could have walked yeah. around and anyway here we are so um, yeah so you're still in the midst of it yeah but that felt, you know i mean that was like imagining that event was like how i kept myself going for a lot of it you know that was the like that was the image in my mind of like being finished you know right like culmination was mm-hmm. like getting to display his work getting to celebrate getting to you know did the thing you know which like the whole virtual tour thing was weird and kind of anticlimactic and you yeah. know, i had my launch and then I closed the Zoom window and I was just, <laughs> okay, yes, mm. my book is launched, you know? This um, is, yeah. So getting to finally have that event on, you know, seven weeks after publication, it feels more complete than it has previously. But that's still now, now that's like a week ago, uh, right. I think a week today. So it's still like very fresh. Right. But yeah, like- we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Well, it's probably like a month or two months, whatever the time period is after your last podcast talk or after your last (laughs) in-store book event or when, like you said, it kind of, then you'll have the space to think about that. So thank you. Thanks for, for that. And thanks for, thanks for being here today. Thanks for the, the first half. Like I said, I think it'll be really useful. I found it really useful and informative, just your experiences. Thanks for sharing your experiences and the lessons you learned about pulling out of your deal and getting the right book deal. And uh, I'm so glad you did because I really enjoyed Negative Space and there, there's so much in there. And I encourage everybody else to go out and grab Negative Space because like we said, it is out. Thank you, Lily, again, for being here and uh, much continued success. And for more about Lily and the book, you can go to lilydanciger.com. I'm going to spell that D L I L L. Actually, I should spell the Lily part too. Two L's, <laughs> three, well, three L's, L I L L Y 
D-A-N-C-Y-G-E-R.com. Uh, again, negative space. I'm Matthew Felix. More about me at MatthewFelix.com and more about the San Francisco Writers Conference, including uh, the current writing contest that's going on, the virtual events that are going on, and most importantly, registration, which is now open for 2022, the 2022 conference. So please sign up and register. Thanks again, Lily. Thanks for everyone for uh, tuning in. And until next time, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. Bye.